Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this series is entitled Managing for the Master Till He Comes. And this is lesson number 12 in that series for March 25 of 2023, and it just so happens that the lengths of different months in this sequence, including the, the February month is short, results that number 12 is the end. We don't have 13 Sabbaths in this particular series. And this lesson is entitled, Rewards of Faithfulness. What does that make you think of? Well, let's jump into it and see what we can learn. Shall we pray? Our kind and wonderful Father, we have gathered here, recognizing your presence to try to understand more clearly the guidance that you've given us through your scriptural uh, directions. May we learn, may we improve, may we share with others is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Every one of us, I'm going to make a categorical statement now, every one of us, if left to ourselves, will end up with eternal loss and death. However, Jesus offers us eternal rewards if we're willing to follow his plan for our lives. What he offers us is so incredibly precious that we can never possibly earn it on our own. And these promises come from God himself. What greater assurance could we possibly have better than a promise support, I'm sorry, a promise supported by God's word. And I think of a, a funny story, it's just not true, but a story that uh, I heard one time uh, about this rich man that wanted to go to heaven. He says, I, I, have to, I have to get to heaven. I just have to. And he thought, well, I'll, I'll, take, I'll buy it. No, no, you can't buy it. Well, let me collect dollars. No, they, they, I'm sure they don't accept, no matter how much dollars I have, they're not going to accept them. And then he got a bright idea. I will collect gold bricks. That will be good wherever I go. So he collected all these gold bricks, and of course, according to the story here, he's a set, this suitcase full of gold bricks, and he marches up to St. Peter at the gate, and he says, oh, please let me in, I'm prepared. And Peter says, sure, why not? What, what do you have in that suitcase? And so he opens up so proud, there's these gold bricks, and Peter says, why did you bring, want to bring all that asphalt up here? <laughs> all the pavement. Paving, paving, stone, pavement. paving stones. <laughs> why did you bring all the paving stones up here? Yeah, that would Pavers. be... Pavers. <laughs> yeah. Pavers. Pavers, yeah. Uh, well, Hebrews eleven six. Jim? No one can please God without faith, for whoever comes to God must have faith that God exists and rewards those who seek Him. You know, I didn't see, maybe you're going to have it a little bit later with uh, Revelation, excuse me, John seventeen three. Mm -hmm. You're talking about the reward, but yeah. eternal life is to know the Father and yeah. the Son. Jesus Christ and yeah. the Son, yeah. who that was said. And let this mind be in you as in Christ Jesus, uh, Philippians uh, 2, 5. Ooh, five. Yeah. So, okay. I mean, yeah. you don't need a big, long treatise about no. on this subject. No, no. <laughs> well, based on all of Scripture, a biblical definition of faith, since we're talking about faith now, stated so well so many times by one of God's best modern friends, Dr. A. Graham Maxwell, is as follows. Greg, could you lead us through that? Faith is just a word we use to denote a relationship with God as with a person well known. The better we know him, the better this relationship may be. We cannot say will be because we know of the story of Lucifer. Faith implies an attitude toward God of love, trust, and deep admiration. It means having enough confidence in Him based upon the more than adequate evidence revealed to be willing to believe whatever He says as soon as we are sure that He is the one who has said it, to accept whatever He offers as soon as we are sure that He is the one who is offering it, and to do whatever He wishes as soon as we are sure He is the one who wishes it, without reservation, for the rest of eternity. Anyone who has such faith is perfectly safe to save. This is why faith is the only requirement of heaven. Faith also means that like Abraham, Job, and Moses, God's friends, we know God well enough to reverently ask Him, why? 
A. Graham Maxwell, you can trust the Bible. Okay, what little we do know about the heavenly reward and the new earth, which will come after the millennium, is so far beyond our understanding as to be incomprehensible. I mean, let's just, I mean, okay. Um, Gordon? From Great Controversy, Ellen White. A fear of making the future inheritance seem too material has led many to spiritualize away the very truths which lead us to look upon it as our home. Christ assured his disciples that he went to prepare mansions for them in the Father's house. Those who accept the teachings of God's word will not be wholly ignorant concerning the heavenly abode. And yet I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. 1 Corinthians 2.9 <clears throat> Human language is inadequate to describe the reward of the righteous. It will be known only to those who behold it. No finite mind can comprehend the glory of the paradise of God. Great Converse 674 to 5. Okay, so how many does that eliminate? No finite mind. I think that's probably all of us around this table, right? And everybody else alive in the world at the moment. How could anyone not want to be there for those rewards? Look, look at what it says next. Matthew 5, 11, 12. Happy are you when people insult you and persecute you and tell all kinds of evil lies against you because you are my followers. Be happy and glad for a great reward is kept for you in heaven. This is how the prophets who lived before you were persecuted. As sinful and selfish human beings, is it easy for us to be glad and happy when we are persecuted? Doesn't seem right, does it? Always before us, we have the example of Jesus. We could add others to that example, Paul and Peter, even John the Baptist. Each of these individuals died a martyr's death. Are we prepared even to die for the truth? Hmm. Well, let us be clear that even being persecuted and being willing to die for God could never earn salvation. I mean, would you be willing to give up your life right now if it would guarantee your salvation? I would. Our works could never do anything to settle the conflict over God's character and how he runs his government, which are the key issues in the great controversy. So no matter, I mean, nothing that we could do here on this earth is going to resolve the great controversy. The great controversy will not be over until everyone in the entire universe is committed to God's loving way of running his government and until all trace of rebellion is gone. So, how's that going to happen? Surely anyone who seriously considers rewards that will be offered to the faithful would want them. They would recognize anything that they could do on this earth could never, re never pay for a place there. But there is place before us, if we're willing to see it, a very stark contrast between two choices, eternal life or eternal death. You cannot have half of one and half the other. Half of you dies and half of you lies. No, that wouldn't work, would it? You cannot have, uh, I'm sorry, this is an all or nothing choice. Everyone will receive one or the other. So a couple of verses there. Romans 6, 23. For sin pays its wage. How does it pay its wage? Death. But God's free gift is eternal life and union with Christ Jesus our Lord from our Good News Bible. And then John 3, 16, very familiar verse. For God loved the world so much that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not die, but have eternal life. It's hard to imagine two more stark or more distinct choices. God has always been the creator and ruler of the universe. But Lucifer slash Satan tried to challenge God's way of doing things. Are we completely convinced that God's way of running the universe is the only way? Which will we choose? What's the choice? Love or selfishness? Love, selfishness. Look at Jesus' promise to his disciples on his last night with them. John 14. 
Jim, I think that's yours. John 14, verses 1 to 3. Do not be worried and upset, Jesus told them. Believe in God and believe also in me. There are many rooms in my Father's house, and I am going to prepare a place for you. I would not tell you this if it were not so. And after I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to myself so that you may be there, can be where, that you may be where I am. Okay. Good. Let us be clear. There was no reason for Christ to have come the first time and go through all that he did if he does not plan to come back and finish the job of saving his faithful people. Anybody? I like to say, use the term many times instead of say, but use the term heal. He doesn't yeah. need to do, do it sometime in the future. The process can begin now. Yeah, and, uh, that's also true. Because save and heal, same word in that's Greek. Right. That's why I yeah. brought it up. <clears throat> he has won the great controversy, and evil will be eliminated when every one of us has made our choice, the wicked to perish and the righteous to live forever. Now, they may not realize that they're choosing wickedness, that they're choosing to die, but that's what they will choose because they choose selfishness. Okay, Greg? Okay, <clears throat> Revelation 21, 1 through 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth disappeared and the sea vanished. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared and ready, like a bride dressed to meet her husband. I heard a loud voice speaking from the throne. Now God's home is with human beings. He will live with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them, and he will be their God. He will wipe away all tears from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more grief or crying or pain. The old things have disappeared. Then the one who sits on the throne said, And now I make all things new. He also said to me, Write this, because these words are true and can be trusted. And he said, It is done. I am the first and the last, the beginning and the end. To anyone who is thirsty, I will give the right to drink from the spring of the water of life without paying for it. Those who win the victory will receive this from me. I will be their God, and they will be my children. But cowards, traitors, perverts, murderers, the immoral, those who practice magic, those who worship idols, and all liars, the place for them is a lake burning with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came to me and said, Come, and I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. The Spirit took control of me, and the angel carried me to the top of a very high mountain. He showed me Jerusalem, the holy city, coming down out of heaven from God and shining with the glory of God. The city shone like a precious stone, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with twelve gates and with twelve angels in charge of the gates. On the gates were written the names of the twelve tribes of the people of Israel. There were three gates on each side, three on the east, three on the south, three on the north, and three on the west. The city's wall was built on twelve foundation stones, on which were written the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. I'm going to interrupt for just a second, Craig. <clears throat> Imagine the, t the day when Jesus was picking out his... 12 disciples, and he would, he had spent the night, the entire night before, discussing that business with his father. And they thought that they were being chosen to be high-level officials in the government, the new government of Judah, and that he was going to be the king. What if he had told them instead that almost every one of you is going to be a martyr, but you get to have your name on the foundations of the city of God. How would they have, how would they have responded, do you think? Does Judas have his name there? Well, he was not one of the twelve. It is. Well, he, he was one well, of the he twelve. He was one of the twelve. But he's the only one who the Lord didn't call. That's right. Yeah. 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 You just think about that anyway. The foundation stones. Wow. Okay. 
The angel who spoke to me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city, its gates and its wall. The city was perfectly square, as wide as it was long. The angel measured the city with his measuring rod. It was 2,400 kilometers long and was as wide and as high as it was long. The angel also measured the wall and it was 60 meters high according to the standard unit of measure which he was using. The wall was made of jasper, and the city itself was made of pure gold, as clear as glass. The foundation stones of the city wall were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation stone was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh yellow quartz, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chalcedony, the eleventh turquoise, the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each gate was made from a single pearl. The street of the city was of pure gold, transparent as glass. Good news, Bible. So that's probably the most complete description we have of, the, of our future home. Anywhere in um, writing, we... There's some additional comments from Ellen White that might add, but what an incredible place. It's not the gold or the jewels of the tree of life that is most important in heaven. The most important reward for all is to see the members of the Godhead and enjoy their friendship. Can you imagine giving Jesus a hug? What about hugging the Father or the Holy Spirit? Will we really be God's friends? John 15, 15, Jesus said, I do not call you servants any longer because servants do not know what their master is doing. Instead, I call you friends because I have told you everything I have heard from my father. Good News Bible. They were good enough friends, so they ended up, ended up with their names on the foundation stones of the New Jerusalem, huh? That was pretty impressive. It's hard for us even to imagine what a closeness to God of that type would be like. So here's another comment about that. Revelation chapter 22, verse 4, they will see his face and his name will be written in their foreheads. So what is the meaning of the term having God's name written on our foreheads? It's the way you, the way you think. Where you do your thinking. That's where they do the thinking, isn't it? Yeah, yes. exactly. So that would mean that God's ideas, His love, His compassion, all of that permeates our thinking. I want Lord. to go. Go ahead. I want to go back to the New Jerusalem, though. You know, mm -hmm. the, it's going to be pretty long, pretty tall building. Uh, mm -hmm. How it's going to be, we do not know. Uh, the large, tallest building is now going to be in Riyadh, you know, yep. so there will be. But anyways, um, the wall, beautiful wall, the, the climactic event of the whole thing is going to happen on the wall. Mm -hmm. you know, right. After that, is there a need for the wall anymore? I do not know, but it's, you know, what every knee shall bow yep. uh, when the Lord is on the wall. Philippians 2. Yes. Yeah. Well... Let's now ask a question. We just read Revelation 21. Is there any sin that Jesus cannot forgive? We just saw a list of sins that's going to keep people out of heaven. Sin against the Holy Spirit? Is they going to keep them out or they just not, don't want to be there? Okay. Well, the only reason these sins lead to the second death is because those who practice them refuse to give their sins up. And they refuse to listen. Yeah, well... I mean, but that's, yeah, they, that's the greatest commandment was is to listen. Hear all the Israel. Uh, yeah. and, just today's news that uh, the Pope uh, Francis is saying um, homosexuality is okay. It, it's, <laughs> no, it's not a crime. It it's it's still not a, a crime. <laughs> it's still a sin, but it's not a crime. Right. Oh, it's not. A, it's not a crime, but it, it, it's it's uh, it is a sin. I, yeah, that's, yeah. Getting a little hard for me to understand. <laughs> These things now. Well, crimes are, that's what, those are man-made laws, okay? Man-made laws can always be changed, but 
laws were in described from the Bible are really the way, a disc, like gravity, that's a law. Right. But all other laws are really statutes, law codes, commandments, commandment, all that sort of stuff is, is they, they could be tweaked. Well, on Jesus' last day in the temple, he confounded both the Pharisees and the Sadducees, turning their traps designed to catch him back on them. The disciples had followed him from Galilee to Jerusalem and were expecting him to become the new king of Israel. So after he had completely defeated his enemies in the temple, he left the temple and traveled across the valley to the Mount of Olives. There his disciples asked him, Matthew 24, 3, As Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him in private. Tell us when all this will be, they asked, and what will happen to show that it is the time for your coming and the end of the age? Well, Jesus knew that he had only three days left before his crucifixion. But his disciples had no idea what was coming. They were, they were, they were, so, they were ecstatic because he is going to be the new king. So to try to help them plan for the future, he told the story of an individual who was preparing to take a long journey. Guess who was taking a long journey? <laughs> he left his property in the hands of his servants. Okay, who are we? That's me, I think. Matthew 25, 14 to 19. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Once there was a man who was about to go on a journey. He called his servants and put them in charge of his property. He gave to each one according to his ability. To one he gave 5,000 gold coins, to another he gave 2,000, and to another he gave 1,000. Then he left on his journey. The servant who had received 5,000 coins went out, went at once and invested his money and earned another 5,000. In the same way, the servant who had received 2,000 coins earned, coins, earned another 2,000. But the servant who had received 1,000 coins went off dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. We're all, I think, familiar with that story. So what do these talents or gold coins actually represent? Jim? It was then shown that the, that the parable of I the was then shown. I was then shown that the, talent, the parable of the talents has not been fully understood. This lesson of importance was given to the disciples for the benefit of Christians living in the last days. And these talents do not represent merely the ability to preach and instruct from the Word of God. The parable applies to the temporal means which God has entrusted to His people. Those to whom the five and the two talents were given traded and doubled that each were committed to their trust. God requires of those who have their possessions here to put their money out to, to usury for him, to put it into the cause of, to spread the truth. And it is the truth, excuse me, and if the truth lives in the heart of the receiver, he also will aid with his substance in sending the truth to others, and through his efforts, his influence, and his means, other souls embrace the truth and begin also to work for God. I saw that some of the God's professed people are like the man who hid his talent in the earth. They keep their possessions and means from doing good and to good to God's cause. They claim that it is their own and that they have a right to do what they pl please with their own, and souls are not saved by any judicious effort they make with their Lord's excuse me, with their Lord's money. Just, excuse me, as judgment passes upon the house of God, the angels keep faithful record of every man's work. Their sentence is recorded by their name, and the angel is commissioned to spare them not, but to cut them down at the time of the slaughter, and that which was committed in their trust is taken from them. Their earthly treasure is then swept away, and they have lost all. The crowns they might have worn had been waste, had they been faithful and put upon the heads of those saved by the faithful servants whose means were constantly in use for God. And every one they have excuse me, and and every one they have been the means of saving, add their stars to their crowns in glory and increase their eternal reward. Ellen White, Spiritual Gifts, Volume Four, page thirty eight. Okay. Wow. 
It is important to notice something else about that parable that Jesus told his disciples. Those who were faithful were invited to, quote, come in and share his happiness. Does the sharing, of God's hap does the sharing in God's happiness sound like the future you would like to be a part of? <laughs> it sounds pretty good to me. <laughs> How will you fare when God comes to, quote, settle accounts? The Christian that we know the most about from New Testament times is Paul. Paul's life began as a privileged Pharisee from wealthy family sent to Jerusalem to be educated by the best teachers in the world. Who could have guessed what was coming for Paul? God knew. <laughs> okay. Paul comments about this, 2 Corinthians 11, 24 to 33. Gordon, is it? Greg, that's yours. Five times I was given the 39 lashes by the Jews. Three times I was whipped by the Romans. And once I was stoned. Let me interrupt for a second. What did they say about the 39 lashes? Why was it 39? One short of death. They believed that 40 lashes would kill you. So five times he'd already been through that. Okay, go ahead, Craig. I have been in three shipwrecks, and once I spent 24 hours in the water. In my many travels, I have been in danger from floods and from robbers, in danger from fellow Jews and from Gentiles. There have been dangers in the cities, dangers in the wilds, dangers on the high seas, and dangers from false friends. There has been work and toil. Often I have gone without sleep, I have been hungry and thirsty. I have often been without enough food, shelter, or clothing. And not to mention other things, every day I am under the pressure of my own concern or of my concern for all the churches. When someone is weak, then I feel weak too. When someone is led into sin, I am filled with distress. If I must boast, I will boast about things that show how weak I am. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, blessed be his name forever, knows that I am not lying. When I was in Damascus, the governor under King Arrestus placed guards at the city gate to arrest me. But I was let down in a basket through an opening in the wall and escaped from them. Good News Bible. Wow. So how did Paul feel about all these experiences, Gordon? Romans 8, 16 to 18. God's Spirit joins himself to our spirits to declare that we are God's children. Since we are his children, we will possess the blessings that he keeps for his people. And we will also possess with Christ what God has kept for him. For if we share Christ's suffering, we will also share his glory. I consider that we I consider that what we suffer at this present time cannot be compared at all with the glory that is going to be revealed to us in okay. this Bible. Okay, now I'm going to interrupt about you finish that passage. How do you compare suffering with glory? Is that possible? Is, God, is, is Paul saying, you know, if I suffered five times near death, I mean, I don't, I don't even know how to compare those things. I think that he is saying, at this point in my spiritual journey, I'm able to use this as a gauge of the reform, progress of reform that God is working in my life. And basically he is saying, I'm pleased with my growth. Mm -hmm. I, I kind of hear him saying, you know, I'm heading in the right direction, thank God, and I'm happy about that. He started out as a privileged Pharisee. Think about that. And this is where he's ended up. And he hated this nonsense called Christianity, and he <laughs> wanted to wipe it out. Right. He says, I can do it myself. I don't need any help. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was trying to do it by himself. Yes, sir. Having received all those beatings and been through all those problems, Paul must have had some amazing sermons. I mean, he must have had scars on his body. Mm. Try to imagine what it would be like to hear Paul call you to become a Christian. 
Paul looked beyond the troubles of this life to the war that he was sure was coming, just before having his head chopped off by a Roman soldier, he wrote, 2 Timothy 4, 6-8, As for me, the hour has come for me to be sacrificed. The time is here for me to live this life. I have done my best in this race. I have run the full distance and I have kept the faith. And now there is waiting for me the victory prize being put right with God, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, not only to me, but to all those who with me love him, uh, love for his appearance, for, his, for him to appear. Yeah. I stood at the very spot where he was beheaded, just outside. Really? Yes. Which the Andrews University, he's from Holland. He used to yeah. take the great yeah. controversy tour. Yeah. He was thrown in the dungeon, you know, they walked yeah. him up the stairway. Man between prison. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I think different times once Paul was there and uh, another time Peter was there. Yeah. Walked him up the They might stairway. even have been there at the same time. Yeah. It, it was pretty difficult to walk up that stairway. Yeah. The so they actually think they know the actual place, yes. huh? Yes. Wow. And there was a little, there was a little, it's underground, mm -hmm. there was a little opening there. Oh, know, I've been the to the Mamertine prison, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I don't think he was, he wasn't beheaded in the prison, do you, or outside. was it? The walk outside. outside, okay. Right, right. Okay. Right. What would life be like in the Seventh-day Adventist Church if everyone was faithful and paying their tithes and witnessing to their friends and acquaintances? By the way, I cannot help it, but the greatest of all missionaries did not have a salary from the General Conference. No, he didn't. None. None. That the twelve disciples. That he collected money from out there and yeah, sent it. Sent it, sent it back. <laughs> <laughs> the twelve disciples yeah. were not on salary, and ten of them died at the hands of others. Yeah. That day is coming. It's not too far. Power of the money. It's going to happen. Our Bible study guide suggests that it might be something like this. The, the imaginary perfect situation. The stewardship vision for the Seventh-day Adventist churches around the world. It's some time in the future. Obviously, it's never happened in the past. And pastors and local church leaders have been successful at creating a stewardship environment in the church. They have taught, trained, supported, and encouraged the church family in biblical financial management. That's first. People are implementing Bible principles in their lives. They are growing in generosity, saving on a regular basis for the unexpected, and moving off from under the bondage of consumer debt. Their lifestyles are, making, are marked by moderation, discipline, and contentment. Money has been eliminated as, as the rival God, and they are growing in their relationship with the Creator God. It's Sabbath morning, and people are arriving for services. In their demeanor is a sense of peace and a lack of anxiety over financial matters, a pervading sense of contentment and gratefulness. Marital conflict over money has been largely eliminated. Wow. They enter worship with a sense of anticipation and expectation of God's presence and work among them. The church's ministries are fully funded, and it has a strong outreach. It extends the love of Christ in very tangible ways to those in need. Funds have been made available to provide church facilities that wonderfully support ministry and that are maintained with excellence. The question before us all is, quote, what is God calling us to do with whatever resources he has, been, he has entrusted to us? From our Bible study guide. Does that sound like a, an ideal situation? <laughs> Does sound like a dream. <laughs> yeah. Think about how much wealth Jesus owned when he was crucified. Not and, even clothes. He was and, stark naked. Yeah, and what about Paul? So Neither of them had anything of human value left. Did they feel that their lives were hopeless and poverty-stricken? Or were they able to look beyond this life to rewards which are beyond our understanding? Jim, Romans 2. 
Romans 2, verses 6 and 7, For God will reward every person according to what each has done. Some people will keep on doing good and seek glory, honor, and immortal life. To them God will give eternal life. Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 6, In the past you were spiritually dead because of your disobedience and sins. At that time you, at time you followed the world's evil way, who obeyed the ruler of the spiritual powers in space, the spirit who now controls the people who disobey God. Let me interrupt there for a second. Who's the spiritual power in space? I think it's it. You, is, this, is this something that was some idea that the, the Roman government was pro proposing or something? I mean, I read these things that, huh? Anybody have any insights into what the spiritual power is? Like? Obviously, the, the context suggests that it's Satan. Yeah. But why is he called the spiritual power in space? As parenthetically, it says the spirit who now controls the people who disobey God. So yeah. That's, that's okay. Satan. Jim? <clears throat> Actually, all of us were taken, excuse me, we're like them and lived according to our natural desires, doing whatever suited the wishes of our own bodies and minds. In our natural condition, we, like everyone else, were destined to suffer God's anger. Let me interrupt again for a second, sorry. We have suggested that God's government is based on a single principle, love. Satan's government is based on a opposing single principle, selfishness. Isn't that what we're talking about here? Everyone wants to do their own thing? Okay. But God's mercy is so abundant and His love for us is so great that while we were spiritually dead in our disobedience, He brought us to life with Christ. It is by Christ's grace that you have been saved. In our union with Christ Jesus, He raised us to up with him to rule with him in the heavenly world. But how do you rule? I mean, yeah. he, God doesn't, and, and we're not gonna be forcing people, that, that's fascism. <laughs> well, and Galatians 5, as we've studied many as times, self -control. says that the, the last of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control. So, but that's only possible under certain circumstances. What, what are the circumstances? You have to have the other <laughs> gifts of the Spirit before, before it's safe to turn you loose to be self-controlled. If you're, you know, lo well, let's just look at that for a moment. It'll just take a second. Um, Galatians 5, 22. But the Spirit produces, okay, if you have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and humility, it's safe to turn you loose with self-control. I mean, if you had all those things, you would be safe. You'd be safe to admit to heaven. There wouldn't be any problem, right? So there's no law against any such as any of these things. Um, okay. But God's mercy is so abundant and His love for us is so great that why we were spiritually did it dead in, this, in our disobedience, he brought us to life with Christ. It is by God's grace that you have been saved. In our union with Christ Jesus, he raised us up with him to rule with him in the heavenly world. And uh, back to your John 17, 3, how do we, how are we raised up? Live, learn. learn about the Father. Yeah. Learn about the you know, Jesus and so forth. Jesus, him and the Father. That's they're the they're the standard, aren't they? And he says he's accomplished the work he was given to do, and he hadn't even died yet. Yeah, exactly. He was a teacher, not a penalty payer. And the interesting thing is that, and and I, I every time I read this, I, and Ellen White uses these terms fairly often. We can become partakers of the divine nature. Partakers of the divine. What does that imply? Well, in the past, many Christians have somehow gotten the idea from church leaders that they would need to earn salvation by doing good deeds and supporting the church financially. 
and we know that uh, the largest Christian church, that used to be a major theme for them, and uh, many churches throughout the world were, were uh, built with money that was raised by, okay, they you want to... indulgences, right? <laughs> well, that's one of them. Kind of like a paying, for, paying it forward or something like that. <laughs> One of, the, one of the ways that they raised money. It's but you forward for your own sins. Yeah, yeah. But you travel into, into like Central America or South America, and you come to these small villages, and there's quite an elaborate church in the middle of these villages. Where did that money come from? I mean, it, was, it didn't come down from heaven, I can assure you. You know, those people were, everybody in that village, as poor as they were, were told, okay, bring your offerings and... But did, were they doing it because they understood or they were doing it because they were pressured? Well, I mean, if someone said to you, the only way you can be saved is if you give an offering, are you gonna, what are you gonna that say? Was, that was like, like a fire insurance premium, wasn't it, for them? Sure, <laughs> that was the idea. Well, in the past, many Christians have somehow gotten the idea, as we've already mentioned. Uh, it is very clear from a careful reading of the scriptures that that would be impossible. What can we do to, what can we do to earn salvation? Greg? 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3. I may be able to speak the language of human beings and even of angels. But if I have no love, my speech is no more than a noisy gong or a clanging bell. I may have the gift of inspired preaching. I may have all knowledge and understand all secrets. I may have all the faith needed to move mountains. But if I have no love, I am nothing. I may give away everything I have and even give up my body to be burnt. But if I have no love, this does mean no good. Okay, so in light of those words, what can we do to earn salvation? Nothing. Only, only having lives that are completely controlled by love, and that's God's, that's the basic principle of his government, isn't it? So he says, if you're, if you're not willing to have lives controlled by love, you, you, I, I can't, I can't admit you here to heaven. He just, we've looked at these passages sometime in the past, I don't have them right here, but for as self, selfish a person as Satan is, living in a in the heavenly environment would be torture to him. Torture to him because of his selfishness. He would have to, he would have to practice love in order to live there. And practicing love would be completely, it would be torturous to him. Wow. The only thing that God is asking from us is a faith relationship leading us to accept his plan for our lives. And if you remember Romans 14, 23, it says, faith leads us closer to God, sin takes us away from God. So are we, are we constantly going back and forth or are we making progress in one direction? So how do we resolve the apparent contradiction being, between being saved by faith and rewarded for our works. The truth is that faith works. Those who have come to love Jesus truly will do everything they can to work for him. We cannot do anything by ourselves to earn salvation. The only thing we can do is exercise faith by taking time in Bible study and prayer and allowing the Holy Spirit and Jesus to transform us into children and friends of God. How do we become friends of God? That's the challenge. This requires... You gotta, if, if it's friendship like John 15, 15, yeah. you don't have a, a hierarchy. No. I mean, and so there's gonna be a lot of people out of a job. Yeah. <laughs> At least they're gonna have to change their profession. <laughs> we, would, we, we won't have, you know, half a dozen people we gotta go through before we can get to Jesus. Nothing like that. Okay, this come, uh, so Bible study and prayer and allowing Jesus to come into our lives, that requires a commitment. Spending time studying and praying and witnessing 
The third option, the third thing we need to do is witness. And how much of us, how much witnessing do we do? The average Seventh-day Adventist today. Well, some verses in the Bible seem to suggest that the ones who will be rewarded are God's children. We need to remember, however, that all human beings are God's children. They're supposed to be. They are. But some of his children will be rewarded because they are his faithful friends. They've gone beyond just being children, just descending from the line. I mean, we can go, go back to Luke 3 and we can trace the lineage right back. You know, we're all, we're all descendants of, of, of Adam, who was the son of God. So we're technically descendants of God. But in order to become a part of what God is asking us to do, we need to become his friends. So Galatians 5, verses 19 through 21. What human nature does is quite plain. It shows itself in immoral, filthy, and indecent actions, in worship of idols and witchcraft. People become enemies and they fight. They become jealous, angry, and ambitious. They separate into parties and groups. They are envious, get drunk, have orgies, and do other things like these. I warn you now, as I have before, those who do these things will not possess the kingdom of God. Good News Bible. Okay. Try to imagine Paul with this list of troubles. He must have seen all of these things. You know, he's, he's talking about things he knows about. We don't know what, we have very little idea, put it that way, of what the society was like that he actually lived in. But he, he traveled, I mean, he traveled yeah. thousands of miles. Thousands, thousands of miles. Thousands of miles. Right. Yeah. He must have flown. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. He had to walk, huh? He had to walk. Or go by ship. And here's a yes. question uh, that I've had asked of me, and let me pass it on to you. Did he ever ride horseback? Yes. He probably had to. It's not written anywhere in the Bible that I've come across. But not that I'm aware of. Horseback? But, yeah. How did they get to Damascus? He, uh, Does it say? I thought... He fell off the horse. He f no, no. He, just, he fell to the ground. It doesn't it say he fell off the horse. I'll have to check that. Yeah. I don't think it's any, I've never heard of a record that he used other conveyances besides walking. That doesn't mean he didn't, but it seemed like the ship, of course. Yeah. 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 yeah the maybe, ship. maybe Philip, uh, like Philip, the angel transported him <laughs> down to the <laughs> <laughs> eunuch. <laughs> well, it would be nice. He had a lot of long distance traveling to do. He probably had some written record of it. <laughs> it kept him healthy. <laughs> okay, so what are you willing to do to show that you're God's friend? Sinning just makes us children of wrath. Look at that passage, Ephesians 2, 3. Actually, all of us were like them and lived according to our natural desires, doing whatever suited the wishes of our own bodies and minds. In our natural condition, we, like everyone else, were destined to suffer God's anger. Okay, then to the verse I already quoted part of, Romans 14, 23. But if they have doubts about what they eat, and remember this is a discussion about whether it's all right to eat food offered to idols. Not, this is not a question about diet or about cholesterol. This is a question about, okay, if you eat food that has been offered to idols, are you actually worshiping that idol? And that was the food that was being offered in, in the city of Corinth. So Romans 14, 23, and, and Paul was in Corinth when he wrote to Romans. But if they have doubts about what they eat, God condemns them when they eat it because their action is not based on faith. And anything that is not based on faith is doubt. I'm sorry, is sin. I'm sorry. So I was thinking about, okay, why is doubting, doubting such an issue? But if they have doubts about what they eat, God condemns them when they eat it? Well, I think they just read Daniel, uh, and so they were having problems. <laughs> well, it, it would be a problem if you... Daniel did one thing because of 
following God's will, and Paul did what seemed to be just the opposite, still following God's will. We don't have time to compare those two, but... It's situation ethics. <laughs> oh, you didn't have to mention that, did you? <laughs> okay, so faith is what draws us nearer to God and sin takes us away from God. If we are willing, and, and that's what takes us away from God, that's God's wrath. If we're going away from God as fast as we can go, then God says, okay, if you're determined to go, that's God's wrath. If we are willing, each one of us has been given a charge by Jesus Christ himself to do his work, to return our faithful tithes and offerings to his cause and to witness to others of the truth. There are only three things that we are told to do to grow our Christianity. Bible study, prayer, and witnessing. If you boil down the Bible, those are the, there, you know, there are other aspects, but there are, these are the three things that we're supposed to, to do to grow our Christianity. Paul recognized that living the Christian life would not be easy. 1 Corinthians 29, 24, is that yours, Charles, I think? 24 to 27. Surely you know that many runners uh, take part in the race, but only one of them wins the prize. Run, then, in such a way as to win their prize. Every athlete in training submits to strict discipline in order to be crowned with a wreath that, with, with, that will la would not last. But we do it for one that will last forever. That is why I run straight for the finishing line. That is why I am like a boxer who does not waste his punches. I harden my body with blows and bring it under complete control to keep myself from being disqualified after having called others to the con contest. I, I'm going to take just a moment. Whenever I read this passage, I think of my own experience. The first time I climbed Mount Kilimanjaro, which is the highest mountain in Africa, 19,304 feet, I came down, I had a, a, just a guide with me, just the two of us, I came down and he had gone ahead of me a little ways on the way down. He was really trekking and I was, I was moving pretty fast and he disappeared. I, could, I didn't know where he went. I thought, oh no, he was actually, at that point in time, he was carrying my backpack. And I thought, boy, I just lost my backpack. No, a little while later, he showed up and he had gone out and he picked a certain kind of a plant and woven me a wreath. Mm -hmm. That was my proof that I had reached the top of Mount Kilimanjaro. And I tried to keep it, but it didn't last very long. <laughs> so that's what I think of the wreath that Paul talks about. Okay, Philippians 3.14. So I run straight towards the goal in order to win the prize, which is God's call through Christ Jesus to the life above. The fact that God has already won the great controversy, let's be clear about that. God has already won the great controversy, and we merely join the winning side does not mean that it will be easy. Satan will do everything he possibly can to make our lives as difficult as possible. How, how, how could Satan make our lives difficult? Revelation 13 says he's going to try to kill us, doesn't he? We will suffer affliction. Some might even be martyred. But we can survive because we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus and what he did for us. John 16, 33. Jim, I think that's yours. I have told you this so that you will have peace by Excuse me, peace being united to me. The world will make you suffer, but, he, but be brave. I have defeated the world. Good news Bible. We are naturally selfish. We tend to want to keep what we have for us, for ourselves, we have earned for ourselves. But we know that we were created by God. We are saved by God. We are sustained every day by God. Craig? Acts 17, 28, as someone has said, in him we live and move and exist. It is as some of your poets have said, we too are his children. In James 1.17, every good gift and every perfect present comes from heaven 
It comes down from God, the creator of the heavenly lights, who does not change or cause darkness by turning. In Ephesians 2.10, God has made us what we are, and in our union with Christ Jesus, he has created us for a life of good deeds, which he has already prepared for us to do. Created us for a life of good deeds. Are we prepared to do the good deeds that God has created us to do? Are we going to be faithful to the Master? No matter what our personal future is on this earth, we can look forward to a glorious future in God's kingdom. 1 Corinthians 15, Gordon? Verses 45 to 58, For the scripture says, The first man, Adam, was created a living being, but the last Adam is the life-giving spirit. It is not the spiritual that comes first, but the physical, and then the spiritual. The first Adam made of earth came from the earth. The second Adam came from heaven. Those who belong to the earth are like the one who was made of earth. Those who are of heaven are like the one who came from heaven. Just as we wear the likeness of the man made of earth, so we will wear the likeness of the man from heaven. That's quite a, quite a promise, isn't it? Yeah. What I mean, brothers and sisters, is that what is made of flesh and blood cannot share in God's kingdom, and what is mortal cannot possess immortality. We have just less than a minute. Do you want to summarize? Well, th this verse, the next verses you're going to read, I think, are pretty good. Listen to the secret truth. We shall not all die, but when the last trumpet sounds, we shall all be changed in an instant, as quickly as the blinking of an eye. For when the trumpet sounds, the dead will be raised, never to die again, and we shall all be changed. For what is mortal must be changed into what is immortal. What, we, what will die must be changed into what cannot die. So let me interrupt there. Which side do we want to be on? In this series of lessons, we've talked about a number of things that we can do to support God's cause, to be faithful to Him, and to be managers for the Master. Are we willing to commit ourselves to that goal? That's our challenge. Let's pray. Father, we have had this opportunity to discuss some very important issues in this series of lessons. We thank you for providing this for us and giving us guidance. May we come closer to you as a result of taking up these challenges and following your footsteps is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.